Good morning and welcome to this, the 18th meeting of the Equality and Human Rights Committee in 2018. Can I make the usual request that electronic devices be switched on to airplane mode and mobile phones off the table, please? Um, we have apologies from our colleague Fulton McGregor, who may join us. Um, train troubles have uh, put paid to Fulton getting here this morning, but hopefully he'll, he'll get here eventually. Um, our first agenda item this morning is a decision on whether to take agenda item three in private. Are committee content to take agenda item three in private? Excellent. Agenda item two is an update um, on our um, report last year on destitution, asylum and insecure immigration status. We made a, a commitment in that report last year that we would do uh, regular follow-ups on what action and progress had been made. So uh, we're really delighted to have this round table um, this morning with uh, Everyone, just about everyone who gave us evidence last year, um, so we're keen to hear from you this morning, and uh, a new uh, witness in Dr Katie Hawkins, who will, I will come to and, and, and let her explain uh, why she's interested in this topic and why we were interested to hear from her. So I'm going to go around the table and just let you know, members uh, of our panel um, introduce themselves. And if I could start with you, Natalia, if you want to start off and give us a wee insight into what you do, and, and then we'll move around and then we can go to questions. Okay, so um, I'm Natalia Farmer and I'm from, um, I'm a PhD researcher at Glasgow Caledonian University. Um, and my research has been looking at um, the experiences for destitute migrant families with no recourse to public funds and how they, um, the barriers that they're experiencing um, when they attempt to access social services support. Um, I've been um, in conjunction with the Asylum Seeking Housing Project, so that's where my research has been based, and it's been for nearly two years now. So I'm in the final um, stages writing up my PhD research. Um, so it's, um, I mean, thanks for inviting me again to provide um, follow-up evidence. Um, so I'd, I'd like to sort of develop on, on some of the points I raised last time. Some of the concerns we raised last time were around social services um, assessments, um, the way people were treated during assessments, and also inadequate levels of support. So I'd just like to develop some of those issues and talk about um, accommodation issues, financial support, um, and the, the increasing relationship between the Home Office and social services, as well as the challenges in the legal process that people um, go through. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Thanks. Hi, I'm Fiona McLeod and I work for the British Red Cross. I cover policy and public affairs for Scotland and I work with my operational colleagues in Glasgow who offer um, advice, support and emotional and practical assistance to refugees and asylum seekers that have been dispersed or are living in Glasgow. And we provide numerous services to destitute asylum seekers and other, um, people, other people from the migrant population in Glasgow as well. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, Mary Fee, MSP for West Scotland. Hi, um, good morning. I'm Eloise Nutbrand I'm from COSLA. I'm based within a small team, um, the Migration Population and Diversity Team within COSLA. Um, and our role really is to support local authorities um, in seeking to integrate migrants and support migrant populations, including um, asylum seekers and refugees. And we're also the representative voice of local government. So. There are a couple of things that I wanted to contribute to today's discussion. Um, one is providing an update on um, the work we've been doing to take forward recommendations that the committee put forward, particularly around um, the need for guidance. And we're working very closely with partners around the room and with the Scottish Government to make sure that that guidance is available and that it actually can support local authorities in meeting the needs of destitute um, migrants, particularly with no recourse to public funds but more widely have been spending time understanding the challenges local authorities face. And I'm, I'm really keen to, I suppose, reflect on some of the um, future challenges that we see, in particular the pressures that we're feeling on social services. Um, um, whilst the inquiry last year gave us lots of food for thought and some initial and immediate actions to take, there are a few other areas that we'd like to raise around the resourcing of a long-term response and a more joined-up national response that hopefully we'll be able to kind of... Um, share and, and get the views of other partners on today. <coughs> um, so hello, my name is Jenna Ang. I'm a founding director at Just Right Scotland. Um, we provide immigration advice and also advice around ancillary issues to migrants across Scotland. Um, I'm here today on behalf of the Immigration Law Practitioners Association as their representative as well. 
Um, Just Right Scotland runs uh, an innovative uh, legal rights and advice project with British Red Cross called the Migrant Destitution Project. This allows us to provide um, supervision of frontline casework, but also to take legal cases in the area of migrant destitution across Scotland. So one of the things I'd like to update the committee on is what we have seen over the last year um, in terms of the learnings from our casework. And I wanted to highlight kind of a few areas of concern, I suppose, um, one of them being that we, we realise that the work's underway, but we still see some inconsistency um, across uh, different types of cases, but across geographically across um, local authorities. Um, the other two things I wanted to highlight are these. Um, I have a concern about the wider reach of the hostile environment um, and about our understanding, our statutory authorities' understanding of information sharing and data protection rights. And I think that actually there is a real role here for the committee and the government to play in establishing that Scotland is a different jurisdiction um, that has the ability to take a different approach here, or not a different approach, but actually maybe a, a clearer, more transparent, fair approach. The last thing I wanted to raise, uh, perhaps later if there is time, is a shift in the demographics um, in terms of who will require assistance um, in, in this migrant destitution context, and that is the rise in queries from EEA nationals and the growing understanding across um, our advice givers, local authorities, and the government as well, I believe, that we see um, a huge body of additional, um, of additional individuals who will require advice um, and who may fall into destitution and homelessness because of their migration status. Thank you. Um, Annie Wales, MSP for Glasgow Region. Um, hi, everyone. I, I'm Graham, Graham O'Neill, a policy officer at Scottish Refugee Council. Um, really, I echo what colleagues have said, um, and in particular, what Eloise mentioned around the importance of the Scottish public and third sectors working very consciously and coherently together. Um, for us at Scottish Refugee Council, we're one of the main refugee rights charities in Scotland, alongside Red Cross and, and, and others. And we, as I think everybody knows, really welcomed the intervention that, that the committee made and, and really shining a light on um, a very vulnerable population and a growing population, as Jen was alluding to. Um, and we see that too in our work. Um, I think for us, there's kind of three things that we really want to kind of push on today. Uh, the first is that we, we welcome the progress that the Scottish Government have made uh, in terms of a positive response to the inquiry recommendations, which reflected the inquiry's focus, the committee's focus on what can we do, as opposed to what can't we do in Scotland, with the significant devolved competences we have. Uh, but I think if we were to be really honest and constructive, we think that it's very limitless now going forward, uh, you know, so that in genuinely in early 2019 at the very latest, we actually do have a strategy which does coherently bring the public and third sectors together in Scotland around a shared vision and very much focuses on practical actions. So uh, we think that there's a real merit in cross-ministerial sign-off uh, from Scottish Government within the next few months in relation to that coherent approach. So that will bring in the housing, the health, the justice and the children's ministers, I think that's really critical. Uh, this can't sit within one part of Scottish Government. It's not going to work if it does that, because out in society it's across different aspects of our public services as well as our communities across Scotland. Second kind of key message for us is the related to that is involvement. Uh, you know, we are here today, but there'll be a need for a wider set of actors to be involved uh, in, in this work. So I'm thinking particularly, for want of a better way of putting it, the mainstream homelessness sector. I've got a key role to play uh, in relation to this. Police Scotland, I've got a key role to play in relation to this. Uh, and then, of course, the health community. Thankfully, we do have some colleagues from health today. So the second key point is about just very consciously broadening out the involvement in this agenda is going to be very important. Uh, the third key message is resourcing. Uh, the beauty of a strategy, if it's done well, is it will, rec in this case, it will give a real visibility to a group of people who have been rendered invisible for a long time, uh, people with insecure immigration status. And uh, in so doing, it will recognise the intersection between very harsh UK immigration rules and a Scottish public and third sector, which is still learning in how to work with this group. Uh, so the strategy at its best will pull resources, in other words. So there's a kind of real efficiency preventative spend argument around the strategy. But the flip side of that is that there is going to be a need for additional resources in relation to some interventions. And it's best just to say that and not shy away from that. Uh, and we think in relation to things around advocacy services, investment in, in local authorities around social work functions, 
functions. These are these are all key things that will need to be put in place uh, going forward. So the three messages for us is more of an impetus, make sure that we like, involve a wider set of actors in developing this this strategic response and and then making sure that we, we, we don't duck the resources question um, and, we, and we, we think about it as central to the development of this work. Oliver Mundell, uh, Member of the Scottish Parliament for Dumfrieshire. Good morning. Uh, I'm Edward Isaacs. I am a member of the Management Board of Positive Action in Housing and I am a member of the subcommittee of that organisation that helps to distribute crisis grants. I'm also past president of Glasgow Jewish Representative Council. I think it's important to say why I became involved with positive action in housing and the plight of asylum seekers and, and my, migrants. It's really because of my grandparents. They came to, to this country in the early part of the 20th century to escape pogroms in Eastern Europe. They relied on the support of local community groups and charities to survive. I personally, and, and so do the Jewish community, feel a great deal of sympathy and empathy with the plight that asylum seekers and migrants are now, are now facing. And I think it is to, to the shame of all those involved in the administration of and the way the process works that we have people who are out in the street who are destitute and the vast majority with them have every right to be here they've come to escape problems hardship humanitarian problems in their own country and they're not given the basic human dignity of a roof over their head and food to eat on their table that's why i became involved in, in positive action in housing and i hope that i've made a contribution to the organisation. I think it's really distressing from my point of view to see that over 100 years after my grandparents came here, I don't think much has actually changed. They survived because of the support of local Jewish community groups and other, and other charities. That situation is really not that much different nowadays. Have we not moved on as a society? Can we not treat people with dignity and respect and provide them with basic uh, human needs, and that's whether or not they're eventually allowed the right to remain in the UK. Um, I think our evidence clearly shows that by providing them with assistance and funding, there is a fair percentage of those who are eventually allowed to remain in the UK. I would implore this committee, and indeed the Scottish Government, to get over the fact that immigration and asylum is not a devolved power and to see what practical steps that they can take to ensure that destitution is not a daily fact of life for people who are coming to this country. Um, after all, I'm sure that most members of this committee, if not all of them, and the Scottish Government got into politics because they wanted to make a difference to people's lives. Well, this is one way they can make that difference and ensure, as I've said, that human dignity is a fact of life in the Scottish tapestry that we, we now have in this country. Immigrants have made immense contributions to this society and will continue uh, to do so. But the fact um, that it's difficult for them to obtain leave to remain status, and whilst they're going through that process, a number of them end up in our, in our streets, is a shame on us and a shame in our society. Um, my name is Rubina Qureshi. I'm a director of Positive Action in Housing, um, a refugee and migrant homelessness and human rights charity based in Glasgow. Um, we work directly and support directly people affected by destitution. In 2017-18, we directly assisted 1,400 refugee families and individuals. By refugee, I'm referring to refugees, asylum seekers and people who are vulnerable migrants. Um, we pioneered the Room for Refugees network in Scotland. It now has 7,000 volunteers. We also have developed an emergency relief fund, which um, in 2017-18 distributed £61,000. And that, that need continues to grow. Um, that fund is also accessible to other organisations, 400 external caseworkers up across Scotland, primarily within Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, but growing in other parts of Scotland as well. And they access um, both the Emergency Relief Fund and hosting for um, people who are 
without anywhere to live. That includes families, individuals. It also includes unaccompanied asylum seekers. We've played, placed um, unaccompanied asylum seekers in uh, hosted homes where they have now developed a family relationship. And um, otherwise, those children would have languished um, in uh, residential care units. So we provided a solution, um, not just a solution long term, but a quick solution very quickly. Um, I'm very conscious, and I'm echoing what um, Edward Isaacs has said from the Jewish Representative Council and also from our board, um, that whereas in the wave of the refugee crisis after the Second World War, we saw human rights protections being enshrined um, across the globe, um, and being supported and promoted. Um, what we have now is the whole dismantling of human rights protections for the most vulnerable. Um, we're in a situation where we've got over 23 million refugees worldwide, um, around 65 million people displaced worldwide. That's, that, those numbers are going to explode in the next 20 years, um, so that the, the numbers of displaced persons will be the size of America, uh, well, the, the population of America. Um, while um, just like Windrush, the whole issue of destitution is yet another disgrace and another injustice of the hostile environment. We're very conscious we're working within that hostile environment context, but it doesn't mean that racism doesn't exist in Scotland. It's very much alive and kicking, and we're concerned about the rise um, in racism as well against the client groups, um, minorities, um, ordinary people, uh, not, not just refugees and migrants, but everybody who's affected by this. Um, you'll have seen last week the headlines with uh, 2,000 people protesting in favour of the EDL leader who's now, who was convicted on um, uh, contempt of court, and there were thousands and the police found it difficult to control that. That's very concerning to agencies like ours because we're seeing a situation where um, that you can, it's visceral, you can not just feel it on the street, face to face, we're, we're witnessing it with verbal physical assaults, not just within certain communities, it's happening across the board. If you, if you <coughs> excuse me, look foreign, in quotes, um, and we're concerned about the rise of racism as well. So that's the context within which we're working and we are concerned, and I was actually wondering, was there any point in coming here um, without any disrespect to this committee, because looking through the response from the Scottish Government, uh, I have to be very honest and say that there was no pressure being put on. And in the context of Windrush and in the context of Grenfell, today's the first one year anniversary, um, like many other anniversaries, um, but particularly today, in the context of Grenfell, there was sufficient momentum, was there not, and in the context of Windrush recently, sufficient momentum to say, excuse me, we need to actually act on the hostile environment. And with this whole rolling out of the Immigration Act 2016, with the whole rolling out of universal credit, we're going to see and feel the brunt of the people who are being made destitute at our doors. They're not just individuals, they're not refused asylum seekers. And in that statement, somewhere it said, in the response to yourself, Chair, convener, sorry, um, it said, um, it's not an issue for us to support um, uh, people who are, one-off support will never resolve the issue. In fact, we are seeing the converse, which is between 45 and 55% of those who we support, of that 1,400 figure with emergency relief, hosted or proactive casework, um, are actually seeing long-term, their, their lives are stabilised, they're resolving the crisis, and they're gaining long-term resolution. They're getting their papers eventually. Um, and I would use the analogy that if you're in the desert and you need water, should one say, oh, well, you'll not get out of the desert? Or do you take the glass of water and say, OK, just in, on the off chance that we will? And that's the basis on which we're operating at the moment. We're not getting the funding. And um, we definitely need the funding, but that's not why we're here. It's to highlight that this is an issue for Scotland. It's not a matter of a few people. You're talking about thousands of people, not just those who are refused asylum seekers. They're eventually getting their status as well because they're getting the support. Um, and there are people who are very, very desperate. Okay. Hi, I'm Jo Osgar from Scottish Women's Aid. We're the national organisation um, campaigning to prevent domestic abuse in Scotland. We also are um, the affiliated sort of umbrella organisation for women's aid groups working across the whole of Scotland to provide services to women and children experiencing domestic abuse. Um, our concerns which we raised um, at the uh, initial inquiry uh, remain. We and unfortunately have seen very little progress or any changes for women and children experiencing domestic abuse who are either have no recourse to public funds 
are EEA nationals or have uncertain immigration status or are students being able to access accommodation and support services. We have real, very serious concerns about what happens to women and children who are unable to access accommodation and support services, who have to return to an abusive partner or who are faced with destitution. Um, we have our women's aid groups who are trying with very limited resources um, to, and doing considerable amounts of fundraising to support individual women in these circumstances but are unable to do so for all women that require that kind of support and accommodation. We see very inconsistent responses across Scotland from local authorities and how they respond to women and children um, who are experiencing domestic abuse um, and requiring accommodations um, and financial support. Some completely refuse to provide that support and some have definite protocols in place where they will assess and uh, accommodate women and children. Others will say that they will provide resources to children but not to their mothers, so uh, that doesn't really help the situation. Um, we were glad to see the recommendations incorporated in the Equally Safe Delivery Plan, but unfortunately there's been no progress on, on that work um, in relation to women experiencing de destitution. We were disappointed that the Homelessness Action Group um, didn't take an equality and human rights and children's rights perspective on developing their recommendations. We felt that this, so they failed to gender policy to tackle homelessness, particularly um, in relation to this group of women and children, um, and to address women's distinct experiences of homelessness. Um, so these are the, sort of the key things that we would like to explore at the session today. Thanks. Um, Gail Ross, MSP for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross. Hi, thank you for inviting me. I'm Katie Hawkins, a GP working at the Edinburgh Access Practice. We see patients here who are either homeless or vulnerably housed. We often see patients who have insecure immigration status, many of whom are undocumented. And our patients are experiencing barriers in many areas to accessing basic health and social care. Firstly, they're often unable to register with the GP where they live. Secondarily, they're charged for maternity care. And thirdly, they experience fragmented care where the impact of rejection, for example, from housing can directly impact on their health, public health, and then consequently the public purse. We'd like to see easy and accessible primary care registration for everybody. Our patients are often excluded from primary care due to having no address, photo ID, or being refused registration due to either not having completed or starting the asylum process. There's also unfair and unclear charging for healthcare, leading to many people fearing that if they are charged for their care, they'll be reported to the Home Office. For example, we've been seeing a lady whose visa expired. She now has a baby. She was too afraid to start the asylum process because she was fearful of being deported and potentially separated from her son. She appears very vulnerable and anxious when she has contact with us. She finally managed to successfully register her son with a local GP, but has been refused registration for herself with the only grounds of the fact that she was not a claiming, claiming asylum. She's now being charged for each consultation, resulting in her uh, neglecting her own health care needs, including contraception, and her registration being completely separate from her son, contrary to best practice. Secondarily, we would like free maternity services for everybody. Patients who have not started the asylum process are being charged for maternity services. We had a lady who didn't attend many of her maternity appointments due to fears of escalating costs. When we were seeing her, she was five months pregnant and street homeless, due to, at that time, being ineligible to access accommodation. We realise the law has just changed. She disengaged from services, however, and we have no idea what happened to her or her baby. Unborn babies should not be unequitably impacted. We would like holistic and well-coordinated health and social care, particularly for complex cases. For example, we've been seeing a lady who has untreated HIV and insecure immigration status. This has meant that both accommodation and social work funds have been difficult to access, leading to concerns that she may return to selling sex for money. This is an example of the direct impact of threats to one aspect of care, housing, having a direct impact on another, health. 
One case of complex homelessness can cost up to £83,000 a year of public funds. Add to this the public health implications of a new case of HIV, which can cost up to £380,000 to treat over a lifetime. This is a huge impact on the public purse as well. We therefore really welcome the Scottish Government's recommendation that people with a communicable disease are suitably housed, but we would like these people to have access, easy access to all services. We have three main recommendations. Firstly, we welcome the recommendation for clear guidelines for health professionals working with asylum seekers. However, we feel there needs to be more than clear guidance in Scotland. We would like to see the Scottish rights-based approach extended to health, backed up with clear legislation so that everybody can access primary care as a human right, regardless of their legal status, and have the right to appeal this as well. A start would be something similar to the Public Health England guidance, which I circulated um, prior to today, saying that all asylum seekers, refugees, overseas visitors and those who are homeless are eligible to register with a GP practice, even if they're not eligible for secondary care. There is no document like this in Scotland, as far as I'm aware. Secondarily, we would like all those with insecure immigration status to be able to access free maternity services, and we would like them to have holistic, unfragmented health and social care so that their health needs and public health needs are taken into consideration as a priority. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks uh, to everyone uh, for uh, your, your... Sorry? Yeah, sorry, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Alex Cole Hamilton, Lib Dem MSP for Edinburgh Weston. Hello. And the vice convener of the committee. And vice convener of the committee. Thank <laughs> you, <laughs> I was just too keen to get into the questions, Alex. <laughs> so, uh, we, we, thanks, thanks so much for, for all of your, your opening remarks this morning and, and your insights. They've been uh, incredibly helpful already. We have a number of questions from our members this morning. I'm going to kick off with Gail Ross. It's going to touch on an, a, a number of areas in, in all of your portfolios. If you get to, um, if you're hearing something and you really want to come in with a question, you just catch my eye and I'll make sure that I can keep a wee note of who wants in and we can try and keep the conversation flowing a bit. Um, Gail. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Thank you all for coming. Um, I have just set up a cross-party group in the Parliament for adverse childhood experiences. And I think there's a, a growing movement now that recognises that the trauma that children face in their early years and when they're developing can go on then to have even greater impacts when they're adults, and that can include physical and mental health. And some of... Um, the, the evidence that we've heard, but particularly from yourself, um, Dr Hawkins, has been um, really quite disturbing about, you know, children being separated from their parents and um, not being able to access health care and, and, and decent housing and domestic abuse. And it's, you know, it's, it's really just horrific. So I just wonder, um, with the report and where we are now, obviously there's different um, stages of, of improvements and maybe not so much improvements, but just how do we, because when we're talking about Scotland and we're talking about adverse childhood experiences, that's for all of Scotland's children, including those that come here as, as migrants and asylum seekers. So how do we help these children? What needs to change? Yeah, I'll probably not focus so much on children, but I think what I would focus on is the importance of recognition of trauma uh, among this population. Uh, so speaking from the background of working with refugees, you know, by definition, this is a group that you know that have been forcibly displaced, often quite horrendous circumstances from all, from everything that there was a value to them, um, and have been through quite arduous and probably exploitative uh, migratory journeys as well, and then have entered a very harsh asylum system which denies the right to work, you know, puts people on to the lowest amount of, uh, you know, financial support really possible uh, in terms of it's below 52% of mainstream social security, uh, and that has been the case for a long time, uh, and puts people into some of the worst housing and all that, uh, and, and, and then not surprisingly social isolation and, and mental health suffers as a result, and that's precisely why we and others really focused on the recognition uh, not only of resilience, but of trauma among this population, and that our public services need to have that uh, as a priority in terms, and, our, and the Scottish Government and their strategy needs to have that as a priority as they take this take this work forward. Otherwise, you know, we're not going to 
be providing uh, a human rights based service to, 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 to people uh, and obviously for children as well that you know that there's an, there's an additional dimension and additional responsibility there that needs to be built in so it's really just to kind of emphasize again that the Scottish government's NHS trauma informed framework and the funding around that needs to very consciously underpin this strategy uh, and the practical actions that come from it otherwise we're going to be uh, shooting ourselves in the foot because there is a good fr there is a good framework there and there's resources behind it and it needs to be and it's absolutely designed for populations such as people who are are in secure immigration status and have and have suffered quite horrendous circumstances okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so i was just thinking about your question what what needs to change um i think uh so as a, as a practicing lawyer, um, I am aware that actually some of our underlying legislation in terms of our obligations towards Scotland's children um, is robust in the sense that there's, there's no differentiation in terms of our obligation to our children based on migration status. So um, child welfare issues, including the experience of destitution and homelessness, um, require a response regardless of the status of the family and the children. Um, an example of the kind of cases that we see day to day um, are, and, which I alluded to earlier about un, sort of uneven provision or inadequate provision of, of financial support, they look a little bit like this. So um, a family who do not have lawful status, right, will not be entitled, as you know, to mainstream benefits or to housing. Okay, um, And if there is no other entitlement in that period of time, um, it is the responsibility of local authorities under um, the Children's Scotland Act, so under child welfare legislation, to provide some form of housing um, and some financial support. But the unevenness is that there is yet not a, not a consistency in what, how local authorities respond to that. And, and more importantly, the average standards of financial support are low, and I would say possibly unlawfully low. So it is possible to have a mother and two children or three children staying in a hostel or B&B &B and given um, 50 or 60 or 70 pounds a week cash. But that's it. So if you think about three children and 70 pounds a week cash, and I assure you this is a, a kind of a very realistic life case, if two of those children are in primary school and one is maybe a, a, a baby in, in nappies, right? First of all, if you just do the maths, if you think about 10 pounds a day, um, you know, that impacts on what they can eat. It impacts on their, um, their travel. It, it, the nappies and the food clearly have to be free from some other source because you know how much that costs. And that is before you can afford anything that you would want for the child just to go to school and not attract attention to himself or herself, right? So yes, there are free school meals and perhaps you can get a grant for the, um, for, for the clothing, but just think about the day-to-day -day decisions that those parents make, right? And if that is the full financial provision. So what can we do about that, right? Um, well, obviously, we can we can actually fully meet in practice um, our obligations under child child welfare law, right? So clearly, there needs to be more financial provision than that, because I don't think any of us could could manage better than many of the people I see on that amount, right? Um, what you know, the, the observation has been, and this is true, that the thing which prohibits people from taking support um, is a piece of immigration legislation. So if someone has no recourse to public funds, it means that certain public funds can't be used to fund them. But that isn't all public funds, right? As we all know, there, it's, it's easily possible for Scottish Government to make available pots of funding um, or just to make available funding to meet this gap. Um, an interesting idea that, that I sort of, that was put forward recently and I think we could and should explore are programs that address child poverty across the spectrum without regard to migration status, okay? So there is, um, there is precedent for this. An example is that the right to primary school education in Scotland is universal, right? So they don't check your migration status. You need to be resident here, but you don't check. And with primary school education, which is universal, you get free school meals, which is also universal. You don't have to inquire, right? So if we have programs for all Scot Scotland's children, Right, that provide this kind of welfare in the public interest, why can't we create um, other programs that will, that will substantively alleviate this poverty or bring these children up to a reasonable standard? And that is not an interference with immigration control and it doesn't, require, it doesn't actually require engagement um, with the Home Office over their NRPF list. Um, I think that's an equitable um, proposal that an Equality and Human Rights Committee and a human rights-based approach in Scotland could put forward very credibly, actually. I'm going to bring Alex Cole Hamilton in because he's got a specific line of questioning that he used last year and he wants to continue this year. 
Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and good morning to the panel. Thank you for coming to see us. I, I should remind members that uh, before I came to this place, I worked for Abelara for eight years, who delivers Scotland's guardianship service to uh, young unaccompanied asylum seekers and victims of child trafficking. Um, on that, I'd like to uh, just pick up, Jennifer, on your uh, particular answer around inconsistency and how th things happen differently in different areas and different social workers attach different thresholds to support, um, particularly with unaccompanied asylum seekers. We were very concerned in our initial inquiry that um, how um, young unaccompanied asylum seekers are dealt with by social work in different parts of the country and the, the lack of consistency there. Certainly since the Hillingdon judgment in England, there is more consistency as to the sort of um, at-risk status of um, asylum-seeking children. But it, can you give us an update on how that picture is developing? Are, do we have better consistency now? And are social workers employing, you know, um, putting children through Section 23 assessment, Section 25 assessments as necessary, or, or is there still a gap? Um, sure, I'd, I'd be happy to address that because, um, so Just Right Scotland uh, runs a collaborative um, project um, funded by Unbound Philanthropy alongside the Scottish Guardianship Service, so we have a specialist legal unit that provides services to that group of young people, um, and we do have cases across Scotland actually, um, so a good sight of that. Um, I think it's fair to say that there remains inconsistency. Um, I think that actually, though, the guardianship service, um, which is an innovative model and one that's looked at across favourably across the European Union, um, has a role to play and has played a role, right, in encouraging more consistent practice because the guardian goes with the young person and is able to take that pooled understanding of best practice um, and and spend time with social workers and local authorities that perhaps haven't haven't worked in these areas before in order to, to suggest what best practice might be or to support them um, in coming to the right solutions. Um, I think inconsistencies still exist though because you know Scotland's experience of migration and the local authority social work team's experience of migration is still emerging, right? So so there, there will continue to be um, greater training needs and a, a need for greater capacity to understand how to work not just with unaccompanied asylum seeking children but migrants generally. Um, particularly in local authorities that don't typically or haven't traditionally experienced migration. So, um, so there, is a, there is a training and knowledge gap that causes that inconsistency, I think, although I do think that the guardianship service and some of the partnership work that we did maybe five to eight years ago has improved practice, right? The other observation I will make, and I know that um, Scottish Refugee Council will, um, will also probably wish to speak to this because it comes out of the learning from the new Scots integration strategy, is this. Um, and I say this not just because I'm a lawyer, but because um, I'm a lawyer in a sector um, that uh, struggles with capacity. It is that our experience of the Syrian refugee resettlement programme and our experience of rising migration to other areas of Scotland tells us that there is a serious legal advice gap um, all across um, Scotland, aside from in the central belt. Um, and the legal advice gap has consequences both for individuals who can't access um, legal advice to vindicate their rights, but actually it has a, a knock-on impact on the statutory authorities, so the local authorities, the education authority, um, the police and so on, who are also trying to service those communities, right? Because they too um, don't have access to enough specialist information and advice about the rights of these groups. And I think that that, causes, that also causes the inconsistency that you've highlighted, right? I know that you wanted to come in on Gail's original question, but I think maybe you would want to address Alex's question as well. Yeah, to address both. I suppose um, I, myself, um, within my team, I don't actually lead on the unaccompanied asylum-seeking children work, but would be really happy to follow up with you with some more kind of follow-up on this response. But I, I suppose it's a, a point that applies to, to um, Gail's question as well. In terms of um, developing practice, we're really aware of, of issues that have been raised and inconsistencies, but for in the interest of balance, I think it's important to note that local authorities and social workers are operating in really difficult um, circumstances when it comes to um, offering humanitarian assistance to unaccompanied asylum-seeking children, um, and also when it comes to assessing destitute um, families for support, particularly those with no recourse to public funds. With unaccompanied asylum-seeking children, we don't have any uh, knowledge of any cases that aren't being appropriately supported as looked-after children. And obviously that's a really expensive um, a role for a local authority to play as a corporate parent and the UK government is substantially underfunding um, 
the schemes with, through which local authorities are voluntarily participating to, um, to support unaccompanied children. I, I mean, to the tune of £100,000 per child under 16, that's the, the cost that we have. And they're having to come from our social work budgets that are already under strain. Adult social care is under strain, and there are lots of other pressures. So I, I think that's one point to make. In terms of adverse childhood experiences, I completely agree. In terms of um, the impact on children and families when they are... Uh, growing up effectively on social work assistance support, that's a shadow social security system effectively. Um, and I take the point that there are examples and concerns where families are not getting assistance, but we do have established escalation routes and I can't kind of comment on cases. But what I do know is that local authorities are currently looking after families and providing support over um, a number of years. Edinburgh actually provided me with some figures that might just give you a bit of an illustration of the work that's going on. At this point in time in, in Edinburgh, we have about 50 families who social work are supporting, and three quarters of those are families with children. And the way in which support rates are set, because the families cannot access the mainstream benefit system, the families cannot access work in the same way, and those are the levers that in Scotland we believe are important for tackling child poverty, is enabling families to, to work and to access benefits. So social workers are faced with the tough kind of almost immigration officer task first of checking immigration status for a family. Um, and that's a really sensitive task and difficult and not the way that social workers are trained. Then they have to assess the need of a family based on whether they can afford to feed and clothe their child and keep a roof over their head. And if they, through that GERFEC assessment, identify need, they have to pay out of the social work budget um, weekly or monthly amounts to that family. And what we're seeing is a um, £1.3 million bill that has come on Edinburgh City Council over the last three years through doing that. Um, and as I said, three quarters of those are families with children and the other quarter are vulnerable adults. At a UK level, the NRPF network, UK have collated figures, and they've also looked at the patterns in terms of the outcomes for the cases who are on local authority support. And what they've said is that three quarters of local authority assisted cases have a legal right to be in the UK from the Home Office's point of view because they end up getting a positive decision, um, a leave to remain with recourse to public funds. So basically local authorities are having to try wherever possible with very limited resources to um, offer social security effectively while the Home Office um, gets the paperwork it needs or reaches the decision it needs to let them back into the system and, and live and integrate in the way that we all want these families to live. And I think it's right that social workers have raised with me time and time again that we don't know the impact fully on children. And they are living um, in very severe poverty and they cannot be included effectively within, in, within our child poverty strategies at, at present, not the way that we're currently setting up our child poverty strategies. So I hope that gives some, some colour and um, I'm happy to follow up with additional evidence if that would be useful. Yeah, I think, I think it would be. I've got a number of people who want to come in, so I've got Jo and then Natalia and then Dr Hawkins and then Fiona McLeod, so Jo. Okay, just getting back to the point you were making, I mean, I think as far as we're concerned, it's vital that children who are experiencing domestic abuse get access to, uh, with their mothers, to accommodation and support services. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a key issue for um, in beginning to address children's traumatic experiences. Um, and I do take the point that Eloise was making. Um, we know from Edinburgh that they do have a domestic abuse and no recourse to public funds protocol, which means that women and children do get immediately assessed and do get provided with accommodation and support services. But that's one of the few good examples that we're aware of throughout Scotland. So even where there is children and they should be assessed under the Children's Act, that's not happening and children aren't, um, and their mothers are not then getting accommodation and support services and are having to return to their abusive partner, which in terms of their adverse childhood experience is um, critical really. Can evidently see here that the tensions that are playing out um, within this situation. Um, so my concerns from what I've witnessed are the actual practical realities on the ground of how Section 22 plays out um, in, in, the, in, the, in a social work capacity. So you've got the direct conflict there between Westminster immigration control and the, and the social work duty to safeguard children. And, and that battleground plays out in terms of Section 22. Um, I think it's important to note from, from when I've um, witnessed cases that I'll ask social workers, you know, you know why, 
why is it why are we in why have this family been in a B&B now for nearly seven months and, and why why is this family only received in one case 25 pounds over the course of eight months for a, a mum and baby I mean that and that was a huge um, battle to even get 25 pounds and social workers will say you know their their hands are tied every time that they um, need to to they have to go to senior management every time so it's not just a case of um, poor practice or inconsistent practice that they have to always liaise with senior management in terms of making decisions so I think that's a big issue as well that needs raising um, from my perspective accommodation is a huge huge issue and um, the families that I've been dealing with have been in inappropriate bed and breakfast accommodation with no cooking facilities and no laundry facilities um, for lengthy periods of time now that's meant to be emergency accommodation so I would recommend that there needs to be a set time limit on that B&B because in one case um, I've got a quote here from a mum who's explained to a little girl while they're in the B&B and the little girl saying why are we living in a hotel here why were we living in a hotel before why do we not have our own house as she got older it got more and more difficult to explain to her satisfaction the answer to these questions she was like why do I not have my own room my own bed why are we not like other people and she often expressed the desire to be able to live in her own house and that was very difficult for her to deal with and it was also very difficult for me to explain now that little girl was six years old she spent six years of her life in a bed and breakfast accommodation four in England and two um, in Glasgow and she was only um, moved into temporary accommodation after the threat of judicial review so that's the impact upon families in regards to accommodation again financial support is, an, is another issue where the problem is there's no set set um, amount there's not even in line with asylum accommodation so you you were going into a, a social work meeting having to negotiate money um, you know service users should not, should not be having to do that um, and then that's when you get people pushed into exploitative conditions where they're having to get money from churches from friends from, from networks there needs to be a set amount it's not good enough to say, oh, well, we'll, we'll assess on a case-by-case -case basis because that, that puts families in really vulnerable um, conditions. So, again, the financial support there is another one. Just a couple of issues that I'd like to raise in, in regards to the relationship between the Home Office and social work. Um, I went on training with the NRPF network in Islington and there was a Home Office embedded officer in that training. Now, that affects um, service user and social work relationships. If, if the service user knows that from the offset, social work is going to be communicating with the Home Office, it affects trust and engagement um, if they know that information is being shared. Um, hopefully, Jen can touch upon this um, in conversation, but currently, Glasgow and Edinburgh and North Lanarkshire are signed up to what's called the NRPF Connect tool. So that's a database um, that shares information, um, which I find concerning because it's drawing social work into the role of, the, um, of an immigration border guard there. Um, I don't know whether there, there would be any legal challenge on that. I'm not quite sure. Maybe Jen could, could add to that. But that's, um, that's definitely a concern for me, is the Home Office um, connection there. And also, a final point to make is, is the legal process. So in, in the cases that I've dealt with, all of the cases have needed um, judicial review. And in one case, it took seven months for the, for the case to go to the court of session. Um, during that time, the family were in, were in bed and breakfast accommodation and the, the legal process is lengthy, it's confusing, it's complicated, um, and it's so difficult to hold the local authority to account um, with the legal system the way it is at the minute. So those are, those are my concerns that I think need to be um, addressed. Uh, thank you, Natalia. Dr. Kitty. Thank you. Um, in, in, response to, in response to Gail, um, so how would we help children particularly? I think certainly what Jennifer was, was saying, particularly with regards to the small amount of money that people have per week is, is, is really, really valid because um, then, if you, especially if you add into that the possibility of having to even pay for health care, mm. You know that's a deterrent from health in the first place. I think it's really important to keep health. Rem remember that healthcare is a basic human right, and keep that at the centre of um, decisions. 
Um, we, I, from first hand experience, we see the impact of a la and lack of un and uncoordinated access for patients directly impacting on children. So, um, for example, um, particularly in undocumented people who are undocumented and haven't even started the haven't started the asylum process, um, and this directly impacts on their school on their on their schooling as well as, as well as just their health. For example, you know we, I, we've seen um, a family waiting, go, traipsing around GP practices for sort of you know two days on end, trying to get registered. In addition to the fact, you know, they're not actually getting their health needs immediately addressed. They're also trying to get the children into school and all the multiple other factors that you've all been describing. And that just seems unnecessary. Um, and also, uh, feeling back on Natalia's point, um, we see pe people who are very afraid that um, information may be shared, um, which makes them fearful to access healthcare. For example, escalating um, charges, then being potentially reported to the Home Office, which might, for example, in one case, even stop them accessing healthcare for basic contraception. Again, unnecessary. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Fiona. Um, yeah, some of this is just echoing some previous points as well. Um, I guess the first thing I want to say is the level of destitution that we are seeing at British Red Cross has not substantially changed between this year and last year. So um, I, from a kind of perspective of impact, you know, we're still seeing um, a number of people presenting to us at des uh, that are destitute in the kind of first quarter of 2018. We had um, 303 people presenting destitute and that's 516 including dependents. And across the whole of 2017, we saw 833 people who were destitute and including dependents, that was 1,553. So our levels of, our levels of presentation are still, still high. Um, just on the trauma-informed, um, I think that we, I think that one of the biggest things is that this process, the asylum or any kind of a vulnerable migrants process. It's a damaging process to individuals. So taking that trauma-informed approach from the very outset, right across, moving it much broader than health, actually in education, in housing, in all the interactive public services that people might come across, I think could prevent, could provide a more holistic support and hopefully limit the damage that the trauma that they're experiencing is having. Um, on the information sharing, at Red Cross, we are also experiencing some concerns around that as well. And we do think that information sharing is having an impact on people's, um, people's, I guess, their willingness to seek help and support when they need it. Um, and yeah, I think that this is further I, I'm, this isn't an area of specialism for me, so I, I'm hoping the lawyer in the room, Jen, Jen, might pick it up. But yeah, I think there's some questions around um, people's ability to ask questions around data sharing, give informed and proper consent. And I, I guess that that is um, more of an issue now as well than it has been previously with new regulations that are in place. Um, yeah, I, I think there was one more point, but oh. The last point, sorry, that I wanted to make was just in the back um, of what you were saying, um, from a, a kind of local authority, pers authority perspective, I appreciate that there's really tight resources, but when the assessment process is about looking at immigration status first and needs second, I think there's, I think there's an imbalance. And I do appreciate the tight resources and the fact that there's some public funds that can't be accessed. However, I think we have to identify needs first and then look at the resources. Um, Rubina. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the points that have been made there that um, with families that are being uh, referred to our service for hosting in people's homes, the, and also crisis grants, we've had social workers trying to bypass their own systems so that they can approach us, our emergency relief fund, for crisis grants. We've had the British Red Cross making referrals for thousands of pounds worth of crisis grants to our small charity. Now, we run on a budget of around 500,000 a year. We are not the British Red Cross. 
and multiple agencies like that, that, and I've mentioned the figure of 400 caseworkers, they're coming from around 300 organisations making referrals, not all at the same time, obviously, but throughout the year, they're making referrals. And we've got cases, um, significant numbers of cases of people who are uh, families with children who are not afraid to go to social work and are being deterred from going to social workers because they're being told that their children can be taken away, but can be housed, sorry, but not them, which is effectively yeah. taking their children away. And um, those, those families are being sheltered through the Room for Refugees Network for not just weeks, but for months and years at a time. Uh, I think in your excellent report, which is a good record, the Hidden, Hidden Lives Report, mm -hmm. um, I think that's an important document. And in that, there is a, a lady, Olivia, who's highlighted in that report. And we sheltered that lady through pregnancy and through her child for the best part of two years and three months. Um, not just with shelter, but also crisis grants. And now she has leave to remain refugee status. There's another issue in terms of this whole kind of perception perhaps from elsewhere that, that, you know, within the Scottish Government or local authorities that this is all about refused asylum seekers who are going nowhere. This is not what's happening here. You're talking about people whose cases may have been unjustly fast-tracked into failure. You're talking about um, also cases where the Home Office is profiteering. There is no doubt about it. The, the hostile environment is profiteering from people who have got insecure immigration status by giving them limited leave to remain. And at the end of that limited leave to remain, they have got maybe a six-week window, I think it is, in which to apply for an extension of that leave to remain. So if you've got, let's say, a job, a house, you're claiming housing benefit partially, you're also working, um, it means basically... Sorry. So if you've got... I've lost my thread. Um, but if you've got um, a family who's working and they've got this limited leave to remain and then that expires... They've only got a six-week window within which to go and reapply. It's costing thousands per family member. And in a recent case um, of, uh, um, of a client of ours, she has two children. Her daughter has got British citizenship. She, her leave to remain expired. She was working in a care home. We highlighted her story. And um, her employer at the care home said, you are now, after two years of working there, having a home, working, standing up on their own two feet after we'd helped them to really carefully rebuild their lives and um, overcome a lot of different crisis situations, uh, you have to leave now. You, you, she was helping an elderly lady into the dining hall. Um, she'd built up a relationship with all these residents and she was called in and told, within the space of an hour, you have to leave the building now because we can't allow you to stay here working. Um, only after a campaign where we put pressure on the Home Office, the Home Secretary, did they come back when they realised that this case had come to light, which is a form of, you know, the campaigns are a form of protection as well, um, and said, actually, we'll give you six months, you can continue working there. So it's just rubbish. You've got people who are applying under our scheme. You know, we, have, we, we say, well, how are you resolving your crisis? We're not just handing out money. We're wanting to know what is the long-term resolution for your client. And in some cases, we get caseworkers externally saying, why aren't you taking our client? We can't see a resolution, so we can't see what support we can give. Tell us that they are um, proactively working with lawyers and caseworkers to resolve their situation and to consider where they are. So we make very harsh decisions, but effectively what we're providing is a safety net on our own, and charities and faith groups are picking up um, uh, the pieces. Only, uh, I think it was just two weeks ago, we received a, a donation from the Jewish community and also the Muslim community, members of the Iona community towards the crisis grants to be able to provide that service because they recognise that these are people in very desperate situations. And my colleagues and I were discussing only yesterday a client that came in, um, uh, we'll call her Linda, who has two children, and she only by chance had passed and said, thank you for what you've done. I've now got accommodation. I'm now renting. And um, I'm now looking at getting, you know, studying and building my... my, my uh, future up, getting a job. She said, because I was at the point when I came to see you that I was going to put myself and my children in the river. That was the words that she used. And the, the receptionist came through to tell us that. And it was really telling because we were preparing for this meeting today. Um, so that's the kind of cases that are being referred. We are sheltering families with children. This is not just about people. And the Home Office actually is making money by saying, OK, go and apply to limit, for limited leave to remain again and again. 
and people are being left in that crisis, they're at risk of losing so much. And housing associations are now turning to us to help with rent arrears, to prevent people who are incurring rent arrears as a result of their immigration status lapsing temporarily, people losing their jobs. And with universal credit, that problem is going to be multiplied. Rolling out in Glasgow is going to be multiplied. And housing associations are going to see um, increasing rent arrears as a result of that particular issue. It's all incredibly harrowing. It, Gail, if you don't mind, I'm going to bring Mary in now, because um, Mary's got some questions that add in to, you know, and continues on the conversation of, of where, where we've been and where we're going. Thank you, um, convener. Um, I would be grateful, particularly to start with, with, with Eloise, if, if we could get um, a, a fuller update on the work that, that COSLA are doing, because one of the things that concerned not only me, but other committee members um, last year when we were doing this piece of work was the kind of... Um, the disjointed nature of support across local authorities and the role that, that COSLA was playing in that. Um, there was a very patchy provision. Some local authorities were very active, very good. Um, some were not. Some local authorities were aware of the network of no recourse to public funds network. They were aware of what they, they were, how often they met and the work that they were doing. Um, th there were issues around the guidance that COSLA was giving out, the guidance that local authorities had. Um, and I appreciate in um, January an update w was provided, but I would like a bit more information to what concrete steps and what tangible progress there has been in the work that COSLA has done. Because it would seem that COSLA almost fit in the middle, that they have a very strategic role that they can play, both with helping and supporting local authorities, but also linking into other partner agencies. So perhaps initially if Eloise could answer it. And on the back of that, I would also be interested in the views from the rest of the panel and what their impressions are of any improvements in um, the support that, that COSLA are providing or if there are any changes across local authorities. Yeah. Um, so I suppose in the last year, I started at COSLA in June shortly after the inquiry and, and part of my remit has been to look at that recommendation. And we've worked with Scottish Government initially to understand what the different options were for being able to update national guidance, um, what the costs would be, but also more specifically, what actually does it need to deliver? And I, I was aware that, Mary, um, you did raise a lot of points about how does guidance actually do, you know, impact on practice and what, what is it that we need to achieve? So the conversations that took place um, over the summer and towards the end of last year were really about talking to social workers, um, frontline housing officers, welfare advisors, and I was trying to understand what, what we needed to deliver. Um, what that's concluded is that we needed um, more than just a piece of written guidance, um, that actually we needed it to be um, a digital, um, accessible tool um, for local authorities, something that could be um, kind of easily pulled, uh, kind of got hold of, um, because the cases that social workers are dealing with and others are really complex, um, and the guidance, the last document was huge, because it necessarily has to be so. But also we recognised that it needed to um, be, to have a dissemination strategy attached to it. So Scottish Government agreed to fund um, a piece of work, and we've successfully commissioned um, Just Right and Jennifer Ang, um, as well as the NRPF network at UK level, to collaborate on producing um, a piece of work that will clarify the legal framework as it stands currently um, and what the lawful ways that local authorities can operate and provide assistance look like. Um, and we're going to be particularly looking at vulnerable groups and the different immigration statuses within that. We've also, um, within that commission, asked that they support us with identifying best practice and what that needs to look like. So from a local authority protocol and assessment point of view. Um, some of the local authorities were keen that we set out some of the components of a robust and systematic approach. Um, and others were more, uh, who had felt they had that, were interested in can we learn about the ways other authorities are approaching this, and particularly how we can work effectively with third sector partners in an, a multi-agency way. Um, so hopefully it will deliver that, and the work's ongoing, and we're hoping to have it ready by the end of the year. In terms of, in the meantime, um, I've been meeting with chief social work officers at their kind of meetings through Social Work Scotland um, to raise the findings in the inquiry and, and to highlight some of the concerns that were raised so that those were, you know, those discussions have been ongoing and um, 
we've, you know, I'm, I'm confident that we're moving in the right direction, but I also know there's still challenges in terms of making sure local authorities want to wait for our national guidance so that they've got strong guidance. Glasgow have produced um, and have been working really hard with um, engaging with their third sector kind of contacts to make sure that they have guidance um, that can support their staff now. But we've also been um, developing the NRPF network as far as we can, and that's something actually next year will be an even bigger priority. At the minute, it's a local authority officers network, and we've been talking to them about what they need from COSLA. And at the minute, our resource is still fairly limited, but second-tier advice, casework advice, that beyond being able to look at guidance is something they, they think they... Um, the officers would use and would find really valuable to talk through decisions they're trying to make and make sure that they're reaching the right conclusions. So that's something that, that we're really keen that the Scottish Government looks at. Um, we've been meeting, we've met three or four times this year, and we've also been engaging with a local uh, multi-agency third sector network that others in the kind of others might want to speak to, and we're looking at how we can connect the two effectively. Um, I think just to, to jump back a second as well, just while I've got the mic, <laughs> I just wanted to clarify another couple of points as well. One was, um, I think, in case I gave the wrong impression, the best practice that is advocated and that local authorities um, commit to is that needs assessments are done first. An immigration status check is a requirement within the law. It has to be done. There has to be some form of communication with the Home Office um, in order to know that the, lo this, the local authority is acting lawfully. Um, but certainly we wouldn't suggest that an immigration status check should be the first part of that process. Um, and I'm happy to follow up with more details about NRPF Connect and how that's used. Um, it is a data management system. We're aware there are concerns about the way, the impact on people approaching social services, knowing that immigration status checks have to take place. We know there's concerns about how you best do that in an informed way. Um, and that also that's a live area, data sharing and relationships with the Home Office that are required under the law. We know that there's, that can be a changing uh, beast at the moment. So we're live to it. But those authorities are using that system, and it is GDR, GDPR compliant. Um, and there are different ways that they use that to manage systematically their caseloads and to make sure the Home Office are aware that they are supporting cases who need a resolution. Um, I won't go into more detail, but just wanted to make sure that there was some balance to that point. Just, just before, because I, I know that um, Graham wants to come in, um, I'm grateful for that update, um, and it would be good if you kept the committee updated on um, when the Commission reports on, on any other findings. Have any interim measures be, been put in place while that work is ongoing to support local authorities and other agencies? Interim work to support? Interim measures to, to support? Well, I suppose the, the key measures that are in place, every local authority you know, has their own uh, approaches mm. and, and need to take their own legal advice. Um, what we have done is, as I say, raise the issues both with chief social work officers who are accountable within their local authority. Um, and I, I know, for example, various local authorities have gone and reviewed their policies and procedures and spoken to their staff about what you know the kind of communication needs to be making sure that their staff are confident and but that has um you know that that is the extent of COSA's role you know we, we represent and we support but but we aren't able to kind of um take a further step in that sense we have been obviously strengthening the officers network and making sure that there's regular information to frontline staff and trying to widen the number of officers who are able to engage but it is at an early stage. I want to do that in a way where we're aware of what... Local authorities are huge. I mean, Glasgow has 9,000 social workers, um, and their guidance is, will be made available to all of those social workers. We, we can't have everybody along to our network, so we're trying to identify who would the local authorities find most useful mm. to have coming along in addition to the really dedicated staff that we have attending regularly, um, and what tiers of management need to be involved. And I, I think the other the key step that we're taking in terms of the management and governance of the guidance work is there will be a steering group um, that will have representatives from local authorities, but also the third sector and Scottish Government, who will be able to advise on the content of that. But we have a wider reference group and system of reference groups. So we're going to be continually sharing the key kind of messages. And, and you know, there is something about the detail around the guidance, but there's also the communication behind it and the clarity um, around rights and entitlements. So we'll be looking at a strategy for embedding that. Okay, Mary, I want to bring in uh, uh, Katie Hopkins and the Katie Hopkins. Oh, my goodness. Katie Hawkins. I'm sorry I put that in your head. You, he put that in my head. 
He's the blame. Sorry, I want to, to, to go to Dr Hawkins first, um, and then Graham, and then I'll tell you who I've got next. I've got Jennifer, and I've got Joe. Have I missed anybody else? Natalia, you were sort of uh, making all sorts of... Yeah? Yeah, so, Dr um, Hawkins. It's just to um, uh, speak to El Eloise particularly. Um, it, it seems that you... The, the guidance um, when the, the people you're speaking to doesn't particularly include health professionals or anyone from the health sector. Um, I was really wondering whether there's a specific reason behind this. I'm aware that there's huge challenges and urgent guidance needed for social work, housing, welfare and the legal um, aspects as well. But we really need to know, really quite urgently, especially with the increasing number of people who are seeking asylum or may not be documented, what we can do to enable these people to access basic healthcare safely and or, alongside the social work, housing, welfare and legal advice. And because we're just on, we're seeing the direct impact of this on public health, their personal health, and then that obviously impacts the public purse directly as well. And healthcare being a basic human right, it seems that it's somewhat neglected in what you were saying. That you would mind sharing in terms of the... Com we had a conversation, uh, Jen and I, with um, about the content of the guidance and I suppose its scope. So I'll maybe defer to her knowledge on, on that. No, so I'm glad you raised it. So the, the purpose of the guide, it, it's, it's COSLA's guidance um, for local authorities on the rights and entitlements of migrants um, broadly. So, I mean, I think there is, there is scope to include um, in guidance to social workers, right, what migrants are entitled to access. And, and I think actually that would be helpful. So I think within the context of the COSLA guidance, um, that's possibly a helpful piece of work, bearing in mind that actually we're explaining quite a lot about um, entitlements across the spectrum. I think, though, um, I think you raise a really important point, um, and one that we started to discuss previously, which is that within the NHS um, and and for Scottish government, there's also the, a role that, a role to play, isn't there? Um, so I had said that I, I'm aware, just from practice, that there is Scottish government guidance that's now a little bit old um, in relation to um, access to primary and secondary health health care and, and how that entitlement runs alongside um, someone's leave to remain. I, I know that from practice because I've referred to it previously. Um, and I think there was a time, you know, actually when that guidance, I recall when it was drafted, Scotland was leading the way in terms of its, um, its provision and, and the way that it allows uh, individuals who have claimed asylum but don't have a live claim access to primary and secondary health care is still actually progressive, right? Um, so I think that we started um, at a good point, but I do think because of the um, the legislative changes wrought by the Immigration Act 2014 and 16, and also, and we talked about this earlier, also the impact of the hostile environment. So the perception that's created in frontline you know, NHS staff um, because of um, everything else that's happening in England and Wales, not all of which is applicable here, but some of which is, uh, we've, there, is a, there is a situation of confusion where people are denied access to their rights. And actually, again, I think this is a place where, um, with the powers that we have and, and in the interests of public health <laughs> um, and access to human rights, Scottish Government and the NHS probably can and should not only refresh the guidance, but actually um, maybe launch a clear campaign um, for GPs and front, front line, especially primary care professionals. Um, and as, as you've noted, there's some good precedent in England and Wales as to how that can be done. Um, and I don't see why we couldn't do that. And also say, um, and these are the areas in which we've taken more progressive decisions in Scotland. That theme that eh, the Jen's articulating around, it's, it goes back to what we were saying at the start and we said last year about what can we do in Scotland in terms of devolved competence because I think one of the things that I've taken from you know this, this work over the last few years has been, I mean, deep frustration, deep concern eh, about the symptoms of these, these problems and I and, know and we're limited in time. I just really wanted to kind of try and step back a bit here and say, okay, well, you know, what, what can we do practically? So, in terms of the guidance issue, you know, to me, that is an important issue, but there's many other important issues. So, I think there has been some progress made on the development of guidance, as Eloise and Jen are articulating. And I, 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 I conceive it as a, a capacity-building measure, an essential measure that should have been in place around one part of our public sector, local authorities primarily, and what contribution they can play in relation to their responsibilities under certain legislation. But there's a lot more of public sector and third sector bodies. Health is obviously one of the kind of pivotal ones also. Um, 
I've, before I came to the, I, I promised myself to make sure I talk about accommodation options, not in a jargonistic sense, but just in a plain English sense about for people who have insecure immigration status, is any person you know that's at risk of or is in homeless homelessness situations and ruthlessness situations, they need shelter. You know that's a human right and that's pivotal in the true sense of the word in terms of you know mitigating and preventing this this issue. Uh, so. Accommodation options need to be absolute heart of the Scottish Government strategy on this, and that's one of the areas that we've said to them internally and will continue to say is that it needs to be a priority. And they go, well, what is accommodation options in relation to this group? One is in relation to the statutory entitlements that do exist for people in terms of the assessments and then support, and that is an area that many people have articulated, Natalia especially, in relation to the really uneven form of support, inconsistent forms of support around accommodation and financial um, you know, support that, that people with insecure immigration status get through that accommodation option, which is the statutory route, Children Scotland Act, Social Work Scotland Act. But then you go into the other stuff and say, what well, about community hosting? You know, there's been a lot of talk about community hosting within the Ending Homelessness Together agenda. I look at the Room for Refugees scheme and I see, you know, what is in practice like a real community hosting potential. And it's the kind of thing that would maybe need to be resourced if we're serious about trying to you know, make a real uh, den in relation to uh, the insecure immigration status population. The third one is around, you know, the role of shelters. You know, shelters are obviously a very contentious issue, rightly so. You know, nobody in an ideal world wants to have shelters, uh, even short-term emergency ones. But our experience working with people, uh, you know, who have been rendered uh, homeless through the asylum system is that de facto they are needed. Uh, and it's about how they're designed, whether they're safe, who they're accessible to, what wraparound services are in place. Are they actually a model? Too often they've not been a model, but we need to move towards that as part of accommodation options. Fourth, the role of housing associations. We need to think practically about the role of housing associations and what they can do in relation to providing uh, some of their accommodation for this. And then fifth is the role of private donations as well uh, in terms of accommodation. So accommodation options is one of the clear practical things that we can do within the no outside of the no recourse to public funds, um, you know, provisions, because as Jen said, it's not a general prohibition at all in public funds. Mm -hmm. It's a list of prohibited benefits within the immigration rules, and we need to always bear that in mind and, and cut through when people try to say, we can't do it because NRPF and say, well, you can do it. It needs to be a different mindset and like Liverpool City Council are using home office funds to provide accommodation amongst others to, to, to some that, that, that have no recourse to public funds conditions on them because they, it's about preventing and alleviating destitution and we need to do more of that in Scotland and in Glasgow. Uh, I don't want to go into too much, I just wanted to mention other practical measures that the strategy will need to comprise and, and the committee I would hope can articulate to, to the Scottish Government. Uh, and it's the role of specialist advocacy provision, not to set up separate agencies to provide advocacy provision for insecure immigration status, but to go with the grain of where expertise is. So we have Shelter Scotland and we have others like Just Right Scotland, Street Work doing really good work in Edinburgh. We're involved a bit in that as well. And, and you know, that's going with the grain of saying, we want that expertise, homelessness expertise, to be brought to bear for this population as well. We don't want this population of insecure immigration status getting put to get a different type of, a, of provision and accommodation. We want them to be treated equally with human rights, and that means you mainstream their services as well. Um, and Scottish Women's Aid, the work that they do, is another example of that kind of mainstream and impulse in relation to advocacy provision ourselves and Red Cross in relation to working with refugee populations in ASH as well. Uh, the four things about protection pathways, we really need to think about protection pathways because I talked about the intersection uh, that many people, this growing number of people with insecure immigration states have, and there is no dedicated protection pathways for this group of people. We need to have that dedicated protection pathways that bring together at a local and national level health, third sector, local government and others as well. Uh, I know I'm going on, so I'll try to stop in a second. Um, and then the fifth point was just about the context here. You know, that we, when you actually look at the pre-Brexit phase, we're in the post-Brexit phase, and we actually look at the nature of the labour market in Scotland, and when you say, OK, who are the groups within the EU as well, nationals, who are in the lower paid, less, less well regulated sectors, then what comes back to you is Poles, Lithuanians, Latvians, Romanians and Bulgarians. It's not France, it's not Spain, and, that, and we need to always 
keep that focus in mind, that this is the group of people who have either been in trafficked or exploitable situations in that grey area, or have had breaks in employment patterns. So what I'm getting to is the Home Office talk about their settled status programme, uh, and they've made some really positive ministerial statements at Westminster over the last few months from immigration ministers. But we can't focus on ministerial statements. We've got to focus on what the UK-EU agreement says on this point, and that you're going to have to document five years of evidence. And what I'm saying is that many of the people in these labour markets will not be able to do that. So therefore, they are vulnerable to, amongst other things, destitution. So that means this is not just a Glasgow issue, it's in Edinburgh, it's in Aberdeen, but actually it's also a Forfar, an Angus, an Aberdeenshire issue, because Peterhead issue, because that's precisely where these more vulnerable labour markets are. And if I can't, I, I couldn't put it any clearer, this is a national strategic issue. It really needs to be, you know, prioritised over the next few months, as I said at the start. The committee was doing a real job for the Scottish Government in really emphasising that, and I would urge the committee to go back and say that constructively as I know will to the Scottish Government, just to make sure that we really get this onto the radar in a practical sense. I did write myself a question earlier, and it's will future EU nationals who don't register with the Home Office be treated as undocumented? And that's for my future reference to try and find out what's going to happen there. So th thanks for that. I've got Joe, and then I've got Natalia, um, and Rabina wants to come back in to Joe. Uh, first of all, maybe to go back to the, the COSLA guidance, I mean, I would very much hope that that it will be gendered um, and that um, women's ex specific experiences will be um, considered within it specifically and their children's, because um, I know we haven't been involved as yet in the, in the development of that. Um, and I'm glad it's looking, if it's going to be looking at migrants more broadly, because our real concern is over women from EEA countries um, who have no access to, to funding and what happens to them and their children who, if they can't access refuge accommodation uh, or get into local authority or housing association accommodation. Um, and I think to reiterate Graeme's point that we are really concerned is accommodation housing is such a key issue in order for women to be able to leave an abusive partner. It's the key barrier as well as financial support and we are seeing such inconsistent responses <coughs> across Scotland from local authorities, uh, even when women have children, let alone when they don't have children. I think there are specific things that uh, the Scottish Government could do in relation to looking at their homelessness strategy um, in a much more equality, human rights and children's rights uh, framework mm -hmm. than is at present. Um, I don't think it makes women's homelessness visible within it. Um, and um, we've, we have raised that um, with the, that um, action group um, and we will continue to try to do that because I think it's a really important opportunity um, to, to um, address the, the, the recommendations within Hidden Lives more broadly within other sectors of the Scottish Government. Um, we, one, op, one positive thing that's happened in the last year is South Albach Sisters' access to the Tampon Tax Fund to be able to um, fund no recourse to public funds uh, for women to stay in refuge for 12 weeks as a subsistence, subsistence amount of £30 attached for a woman and £10 for a children. So we have a case say, in rural Stirlingshire for women who's been able to access accommodation there um, and with her child. So she has £40 a week to live on. She spends £20 on travel and without women's aid, specifically fundraising for her as a, an individual to be able to provide food and clothing um, so her children can get, child can get to school. Um, she would be very dis much more destitute than she is at the moment. So it's, I think it's important that these third sector and local government so resources are joined up so that they can make the most of them um, and not have small third sector organisations working to try and fundraise for individual women and children on, on a daily basis and using their resources, which are really there to support women and children, just, just being spent on trying to get their basic needs met. I'm minded to run a wee bit later this morning if, if uh, the members of the panel are okay. I'm only talking about 10, 15 minutes, but I'll allow uh, the, the last two uh, panel members to come in and then Oliver to come in with his specific questions. So um, if we've sort of are getting up a bit the time barrier, <coughs> so if we can tighten it up a wee bit, that would be really helpful. Um, Natalia. Okay. Um, 
I think what we've heard today is shown that the, there's numerous tensions here, that they're alive, they're not, they're not going anywhere. Um, I did want to highlight the, the first serious case review with NRPF was January of this year. Um, and that was from Wolverhampton um, Safeguarding Children's Board. And one of the issues that they found was that, firstly, practitioners did not have um, an extensive understanding of the lived experience of NRPF. And secondly, reiterated that there was inconsistent practice. So this is a national issue that is, is not going anywhere. My concern is with the, with the Home Office, um, Im implicated in that, what you've got is a culture of disbelief. I'm really sceptical that updated guidance is going to sort anything out. For, for the cases that I've seen, what's been really, really important is clear channels of accountability. Um, the only forms of accountability that I've seen in my research have been legal representation or, or getting the media involved. Now, in regards to legal representation, that's been really problematic. I mean, there's no test cases here in Scotland for NRPF. Like, why is that? What's going on with the legal process that's making it difficult to hold the local authorities to account? There's a lot of test cases um, in England, and, and Jen may be, be able to explain that there's something called community care lawyers there, where a judicial review is raised quickly and it doesn't take as long, and, 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 and therefore the local authority is, is held to account sooner. I think that that's a really important point, um, and I would like to see that be um, a, a spotlight shined on, on the le how we do the legal process here. Um, and then a final point, just to touch upon what Joe said. My research has looked at um, people with children, but there's a, a dire need to look at people that, that haven't got children um, in adult social care as well that are trying to access social services support through community care assessments. That is a really critical area that needs to be looked at. Thank, thanks very much, Rabina. Very quickly, just to say that um, in terms of, we were here to kind of look at the Scottish Government response to the, 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 the recommendations. And just to say from our perspective, um, we've, we've provided and arranged in terms of impact, 83,000 nights of shelter so far. And that's through the network of 300 or so case, uh, casework organisations with their 400 caseworkers. Um, that is now established. We've got an online system which is called Refer, which distributes crisis grants through the Emergency Relief Fund and also community hosting, as Graham was referring to. So that's a good um, basis on which to address the whole issue of destitution. And it's also a place to gather data, because the data, because of the way it's online, we can extrapolate information very quickly to say this is what's happening around Scotland. And um, we're now receiving referrals of destitute clients from Aberdeen now, who we're now looking into. So uh, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, and then small pockets, but primarily Glasgow, Edinburgh um, at the moment. Um, at any one time, we're sheltering 80 to 120 families or individuals. And these are people who we see have got the chance of being able to resolve their crisis and move on, not just to stabilising their lives for themselves and their children, um, but also so that they can become future taxpayers. That's part of your tax piece. So that 83,000 nights of shelter has actually saved um, government, uh, uh, the UK government and uh, charities who refer to us around four to five million pounds so far. So that's a big, big impact on the part of a small, small charity. Um, in terms of um, a proactive response, NRPF applies to individuals. It doesn't apply to organisations, as Graham was alluding to earlier. So therefore, we want to see the Scottish government support those charities and particularly ourselves obviously, <laughs> but, um, but for good reason, because we did deal with 1,400 destitute people, families and individuals and unaccompanied asylum seekers, and we can document and prove the outcomes. People in very, very difficult situations, not just children, not just women about to have children, also people who had terminal liver cancer, also people who had um, HIV, AIDS, communicable diseases, were sheltered in people's homes. Now, that 83,000 nights of shelter is also about pastoral support. People have stepped in, their communities have stepped in. When we accommodated a family, um, a mother and three children in Dunbar, the whole community came together. So this wasn't just about putting somebody in your house. It was about communities coming together and saying, well, what else does she need? How else can we help with the children? And now that family is now stable. That's an outcome, and she's working, so she's contributing to the tax base. So, surely, for the sake of Scottish taxes, the Scottish Government should be establishing a strong response, proactive response, supporting the work that's being done, because we're being left to pick up the pieces alongside others, um, charities and faith groups. <coughs> and, therefore, that response should be backing that, that support, the, the support that's already been given, 
um, in the absence of funding, because it's very difficult to say we're supporting people with no recourse, therefore give us funding. It's very difficult to do that, but Scottish Government can recognise that and have a strong, I was going to say stable response, but a strong response <laughs> to the hostile environment, because that is impacting up here, and this is just one of the disgraces of that hostile environment. We shouldn't be... Off it. And we really want to know what's happening after this, really. Yeah, yeah of course, too. Oliver. Thank you, uh, convener. I was pleased uh, to hear uh, Grim mention rural areas, and I think it, a couple of other people have picked up on that point. I mean, it's quite clear from what we're hearing today, what we heard a year ago, uh, that, uh, that that those with no recourse to public funds are facing sort of severe uh, severe consequences, particularly of existing uh, challenges like housing. Um, within the area I represent, there, there are thousands of people waiting on the housing list, um, and it's not uncommon for, for all, uh, uh, all, all, all applicants to be offered temporary accommodation in, in bed and breakfasts. Uh, and that then becomes uh, not temporary, uh, with, with people facing you know, very long stays with, with all the difficulties attached with that. In terms of COSLA's approach, I mean, is, do you feel that there, ha there has been progress in terms of ensuring that all local authorities across the country are, are geared up uh, to, to cope with the challenges, particularly with these additional challenges that, that come in rural communities where there aren't third sector uh, organisations active, where um, despite the, the sort of good intentions of, of council officers, they're not dealing with the quantity or number of cases to, to have, have that experience to, to actually address the problems. I think uh, the two key things really to flag, one is no local authorities are not equipped fully to be able to accommodate and support everybody that's in need, particularly those where you know, there is a group for whom there cannot be local authority assistance under the current immigration system. And so one of the things that we really need to see is a change in that UK level policy on how no recourse to public funds is applied and, um, and how local authorities can step in to assist when destitution occurs. In terms of housing, that really is an acute pressure for well for all local authorities. I mean, uh, rural authorities are struggling, as you say, because they can't then draw on and, and work with um, the third sector, who maybe you know can deliver something for some of the groups that local authorities have their hands tied in relation to. Um, in terms of NRPF cases, you can't offer a local authority house, so. Um, when social workers assess that there is a, a homelessness risk for a family or a vulnerable adult and that they need to be providing that assistance, they need to be paying private landlords effectively and temp paying for pri uh, temporary accommodation, which is why bed and breakfasts get raised and things like that, because the, the housing market and is under a huge amount of strain. And that's obviously a high cost. It would be more affordable. It would still be incredibly difficult, but more affordable if it was a local authority option. Um, uh, in terms of that, I think you know we want to see change in policy at UK level because that's where we feel the pressures are coming from. But we also want to see um, the Scottish Government welcome the support they've provided to us to build capacity within the system in terms of training guidance so far. But it, it's the funding long term of our social services and of the third sector, as well as bringing us all together to think more strategically. And one of the big sort of strategic questions that we feel needs to be looked at more is for those who, well, fundamentally, well, what amount of resource are we going to put into the system, recognising that need may grow over the coming years, and particularly post-Brexit, as Graham's pointed out, and Jen, around the risks of EU migrants being a group that are at risk of destitution, what level of resource are we going to put into the system to be able to make sure that we don't have the challenges we're describing today? But secondly, um, what also are we going to do to address that group of people? It may only be small, but there is a group of people for whom they will not be allowed to stay in the Home Office's eyes at the end of um, the asylum process, or um, they're, they're not granted leave to stay in the UK. Um, and they're not maybe willing or able to go um, for various reasons. Now, whose responsibility in, in a Scotland that doesn't want to see people sleeping on the street and destitute are that group of people? And I don't you know, I, I don't feel that necessarily the third sector want to be a formal part of the humanitarian response long term. But if that's not the case, then what what is the alternative and how are we going to coordinate that? So those, those are the two kind of key things, um, if that answers your question. 
that local authorities are imaginative enough in the way in which they, they approach these issues, the way in which they, they work with the third sector? Um, or, I think, or, or do you yeah. think that there are still entrenched views within within some authorities or some, mm. some individuals within authorities who, who, who don't see this as being their responsibility? Well, I mean, I'd obviously say I'm not... In terms of local authorities not seeing their responsibility, uh, COSLA's uh, Community Wellbeing Board approved a paper in November endorsing and mandating me to work on this issue and, and stating clearly that it is local authorities' responsibility. So I appreciate what you're saying in terms of the challenges we've raised today about whether we've got there yet in terms of delivery. Um, but I, I think there is innovation. I, I certainly know that local authorities are benefiting from innovation and partnerships with a number of the partners around the room, but often that is centralised around the central belt in Edinburgh and Glasgow. There's more we can do there, there's more we need to do. Um, so there are a couple of things we've requested the Scottish Government. One is if we take forward a strategy. Um, in other areas of, of innovation and, and service development, there are um, pots of seed funding to test and evaluate different ways of working and changing. Now, the system, the social service system, is under too much strain necessarily to always be able to go into these um, partnerships with local authorities, um, with the third sector, that may lead to a better outcome. So, you know, we'd be keen to explore whether there's funding for multi-agency models to be tested, ones that are already happening in Edinburgh and Glasgow around funnelling public funds through the third sector to deliver accommodation or advocacy services, partnering up with the local authority um, to resolve cases, but we'd also like to see whether we can be looking at testing and working with the rural authorities to identify what needs to happen there. And that may be about building capacity in their community sectors and, and their church groups and, and other faith groups who exist. Um, it might be about looking at how we draw on the resources that do exist in other parts of the system or in other parts of Scotland. But there is definitely room to improve there and we're really keen to work in partnership to look at how we do that. Any other panel members want to say anything about that specific issue? Oliver, content with your responses. Um, Mary, you had a quick supplementary, but can you make it really quick? Really quick, um, convener, yes, thank you. Um, as the convener said at the outset of um, the, the, this meeting, both the convener and myself have, have visited the, the ASH project. Um, and I just wonder, perhaps, Natalia, if you could give me um, a brief response. And Graham and Fiona may, may have a, a quick response to this as well. The last time I visited the ASH project, a number of concerns were raised about the, um, the accommodation that's provided through the, the UK contract through Circle. Um, and con concerns were raised about the, the quality of, of the housing and concerns were raised about the support that um, people that are employed through CERCO give to the people housed. And I was given assurances that changes would be made in the way um, pe people were dealt with, um, entry into houses, and the quality, the standard, and repairs would be done to, to properties. And I just wonder if you would like to um, comment on whether any changes have been made. Well, I suppose my research has looked at NRPF families, not specifically um, that side of ASH that looks at people in the asylum um, system under CERCO um, housing. But from what I can gather at ASH, there are still huge concerns in regards to the way people are um, being treated within CERCO. Um, I think Rubina have probably got a lot of information in regards to this as well, but um, the quality of the accommodation that CERCO are providing and um, the way the staff um, are treating people within asylum accommodation, especially people that are vulnerable with mental health issues. Um, so there's, there's huge concerns around that at the minute. But I think Rabin has been dealing with a number of ongoing cases at the minute. Yeah, just in relation to Circle, very, very quickly, was the fact that, um, you know, judging by like a campaign that we had done just recently, a few months back, um, to highlight a case and what was going on, basically, there was subtle harassment and sometimes not so subtle harassment, forcing people out, threats to call the police. And basic questions were being asked by Circo um, residents. Um, are we allowed to call the police? And if they harass us, as in tell us to get out the flat, does that mean that that is also an immigration matter and that I can't call the police? So they're thinking that actually if that I'm being harassed, that's reserved to Westminster as well. That was the implication of what people were, and we were, yeah, surely they can call the police. And then we were making contact with like senior police officers. And then like, I mean, like, con you know, 
chief inspectors and people who had differing views as to whether or not they would step in if a resident contacted the police and said that I am being illegally harassed out of here. Because what Serco, Nicholas Soames, I think it is, he said to me on email was is that we would issue notices. Well, notices cost thousands of pounds, which is excellent news, which is basically spend more money if you're going to try and force people out. Do that. Why should people have to walk out? And we're saying issue your notices then, and they will be challenged through housing solicitors in court. And I think that's the way forward. So I think they're very nervous. Circle's very nervous about being exposed in that way. And that's what we kind of uncovered through the communications that we had and through the kind of Sunday Herald article that was put in place. We had some conversations with the police last year and, and, and we are going to continue some of those conversations as well about, because it comes back to the points that, that's been made here this morning about how do we ensure that the right advice is going to frontline workers and that's the same for police officers. So uh, we, we're going to do a bit of follow-up work on that. But Fiona, I don't know if you want to come back in on the issue about Circo and, and maybe when we visited uh, last year with you, uh, you were seeing some people who had been in Serco housing, mm -hmm. you know, who had been locked out, not able to get access yeah. to their documents or, or even their clothing and, and medications, uh, coming to you or coming to Refugee Council looking for help. So my understanding is that there are still cases where people are being... Um, I want to, I, I'm not a frontline practitioner and these are not cases that I've had direct oversight over. Um, however, where people are being misled into leaving their property and whilst they're out of their property, um, things have happened to maybe locks or... So, yeah, we are concerned around some of those processes still. Total evidence that we had last year, Graham. Let, let me get Graham in, Rabina, and I'll let you back in. Yeah, I was talking earlier on about some of the structural factors that are affecting people, and you know, and, and one of the ones was no choice accommodation, which is in some of the poorest wards and streets in the country across North England, South Wales, Glasgow, and the Midlands. So, what are these things that are symptoms of really, really bad, poorly invested properties as well? Uh, but then there's also some of the, the unaccountable. A delivery of this public service of housing to people seeking refugee protection and dispersed in this case to Glasgow. You know, so for example, there's never been a report to any local authority committee of any complexion by Circo G4S or Clear Springs. So that's evidence that you have a parallel public service of housing to 40,000, a minimum of 40,000 vulnerable people eh, across some of the poorest parts of the country. So if that's not democratically outrageous, I don't really know what is. So what, that's an ex I, I use that example just to make it really clear about how the Home Office are running this parallel service and then like and we've been talking about in terms of destitution they're letting everybody else pick up the pieces and react to that and then walking away and not actually taking any responsibility and it's unacceptable and i would and the scottish government to their credit are persistently and they've got to keep persistently reminding this because we're about to move into a 10-year contract from september 19 to september 29 uh, which materially in terms of the funding is the same uh, and in terms of the lack of any accountability for country or local bodies is the same as well. So I suppose what I'm saying is it's true what Mary and Ash have been saying. We see it at Refugee Council as well. Poor quality accommodation, at times inappropriate conduct towards, towards uh, a vulnerable group of people. But these are symptoms of the deeper issues about this is an unaccountable space. And just to say, you know, there is active interest from the legal and the housing law community in relation to try how we can bring Scottish housing law standards to bear uh, in relation to how this public service and, then, and one of the main pinch points at the moment in areas of progress in the next year will be how we can get Scottish housing eviction law to actually apply in some way to this so that rights are inserted into a group of people who absolutely don't have rights in relation to being removed from their accommodation at the moment. We, we are absolutely almost out of town, so I get a quick comment out of time, <laughs> out of town. <laughs> quick comment from, from Rabina and, and Joe, and then we need to finish there because we need to decide what we're going to do with this this morning. We need a bit of time to do that. Just that the Police Scotland response was shocking, I felt, that there was just nothing really to go on. And I think that the Police Scotland, particularly on the issue of circle residents, should be asked because when I spoke to the Chief Inspector of one of the areas where there's a lot of asylum seekers, I said, so if people call you, will you come out? He said, oh, well, they might be using that as an excuse. So even when people were being genuinely harassed, he was saying they might be used. I said, are you going to come out or not? Or are you only going to come out when Circle calls you out? Because Circle was saying, we'll call the police, you have to leave. But actually, you have to use 
the proper procedure, which is go through sheriff courts in order to secure an eviction. They were rifle there was also reports of people at Serco rifling through people's um, papers and said, trying to check whether or not you're supposed to leave or not. So all of those things were being challenged. The other area is, is that housing associations are often renting their accommodation to Serco. So there should be a role for housing associations, Scottish housing associations, to be imposing their standards onto Serco. And just very quickly, the final point, Nicholas Soames emailed me. He said, your client did not say thank you for us giving her free accommodation. As we don't want your free accommodation. She would rather have her status. That's not the reason she's staying there. So that just gives you an idea of the tone that we were dealing with with him. Joe, you've got the final word this morning. Briefly, um, the Home Office was due to publish guidance on domestic abuse in the asylum system and funding for um, women to be able to access refuges. Um, who were in the asylum process, and that's still not happened yet. So it's maybe something the committee might be able to bring up with all of us where that is at. We have completely run out of time this morning. You, you'll realise that we could have spoken to you for a, a lot longer. Can we thank you for your participation? This issue is not finished for us. Uh, so, so take heart from that. Um, and if you go away and you think I should have said this or I should have said that, please, as always, come back to us and, and let us know. But we will be back in touch with further work that we intend to do on this matter. So thank you so much. I'm going to suspend committee to move into private um, for, to allow us to decide what we're going to do next. Thank you. <laughs>